going to do now, we're going to presentations from the high school program. It includes both students and teachers. But the first set of um, groups to present will be the high school students. And our first group did a project called Build a Supercomputer with the National Center for Computational Sciences. And I will let them introduce themselves and their mentors. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mason Van Dyke, and I'm from New Science, Virginia. Hi, I'm Diana Cummings, I'm from Bath, New York. Hi, I'm Nathan Smith, and I'm from Bradford, Pennsylvania. Hi, I'm Mackenzie Glover, and I'm from Williamson, South Carolina. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Sprinkle, and I'm from Redden County, Georgia. Hi, my name's Shadi Erica, and I'm from Gainesville, Georgia. I'm Matthew Harold, and I'm from London, Kentucky. Our mentors were Jerry, Papa, Sherry, Ben Taylor, Nick Sersovitz, and Charlene Watson. Okay, and our group was building a supercomputer. Oh, but in order to build a supercomputer, first we had to learn a lot of computer science background before we got into it. Forget it. Okay, so some of the topics that we touched on while we were here were uh, how to use command prompt, Networking basics, how to build an RJ45 Ethernet cable, write a simple program, work with different operating systems, and how to do binary and octal and hexadecimal math systems. <laughs> Alright, so there are this many types of people in the world. Those who understand binary, and those who don't. <laughs> Before we got here, none of us knew how to read binary. But it's actually pretty simple. So to compare it to the decimal system, there's the ones place, tens place, hundred place, and decimal. In binary, there's only two digits you can use, zero and one. So the first place that you have is the ones place. The second place that you have is twos, fours, eights, 16s, doubling each time. So, in order to represent zero, all you need is what is zero. In order to represent one, the first place, all you need is one. But when you get to two, there's no more digits that you can put in the first spot, so you have to add a new place, which is the twos place. So in order to represent two, it would be one, zero, and thus the joke makes sense. <laughs> um. What is a supercomputer? A supercomputer is a cluster of nodes that small computers put together to work in a single network. These supercomputers have like a massive amount of storage, so they can hold like lots of data. There are many benefits in using a supercomputer. For instance, they can process information much faster than any other computer can. They can store lots of uh, large amounts of data. They can uh, also solve specific computations that only a, a supercomputer can calculate. But they do this by dividing the problem amongst the nodes, and it helps to solve the problem faster and more efficiently. There are just as many negatives as there are positives to a supercomputer. Like, one supercomputer generates a lot of heat, which means a lot of cooling to keep the computer running right. A supercomputer can only do one thing very well, so that means that it can't do a lot of things that the speed it can do the one thing. A supercomputer also has a lot of unique parts, which means a lot of maintenance to work these unique parts, which is just as much money as the coin would be. So raise your hand if you have a smartphone. Okay, majority of the room. Um, raise your hand if you have apps on that smartphone, such as social media, um, any other type of apps. Still the majority of them. Okay, those are two very simple examples of hardware and software. The phone is the hardware, the software is the apps. Now, the hardware, we use nodes, which is a single computer, ethernet cables, which we built ourselves, which is very interesting. Um, a network hub, which is like a D-link box. A power supply, which powers your computer. Um, that's the external hardware. But the internal hardware, you have CPUs, which are your central processing units, that's basically where everything 
goes. That's like the main chip of the computer. Next, you have RAM, which is random access memory. Um, this is basically where you can store pretty much everything. And the more RAM sticks you have, the more memory your computer has. After that, we have Ethernet cables. Uh, Nathan actually has a demonstration of an Ethernet cable that we built. <laughs> When you turn it on, if all the lights turn green, that means your Ethernet cable is working correctly. If one of the lights do not turn green, you have to take it apart and make sure that all the wires are working and then try it again. Good job, Nathan. Give him a hand. <laughs> um, some example of the software we use. Most of y'all are probably familiar with Windows 7 or Windows 8. That is a type of operating system. We did work a lot with Windows 7 because that's how we really learned our command prompt. Um, but then we used a virtualization machine called VMware, and we basically downloaded it so we could use another operating system. Um, Linux CentOS is another operating system, but CentOS is the flavor of that operating system. And that's really the main operating system we worked with this week. For our supercomputer, though, we use a terminal emulator, which is basically fancy talk for that's how we were able to talk to our supercomputer. To create our supercomputer, we linked five Apple Mac minis together using Ethernet cables that we made ourselves. Um, we programmed our supercomputer using, using uh, Unix. You all probably are more familiar with the operating system like Windows 7 or Windows 8. Um, using the virtual emulator putty, our laptops were able to communicate with the supercomputer. And we were actually able to view the communication between the supercomputer and the laptop using a command program called Wireshark. Wireshark. Our supercomputer has a processing power of 47 gigaflops. Flops meaning floating operations per second. In 1991, that would have been the fastest computer known at that time. So, the, um, we was out, it outdid the Cray YMP C90. <laughs> <laughs> um, we would like to give special thanks to our mentors, but Lauren, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> just words and ARC. Ms. Jennifer Tyrell and ORAU, um, Jerry Papashier, Shireen, oh, Charlene, I'm sorry, <laughs> Watson, Ben Taylor, and Nick Smith. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for watching our presentation about design of poly novel polymeric materials using computer simulation. I am Rachel Brooks from Mix County, Ohio. I'm Sadie Harris from Knox County, Kentucky. I'm Adam Hubbleway from Wilkes County, North Carolina. I'm Barbara Hooks from Montgomery, Alabama. And I'm Lucas Van Dee from Ithaca, New York, and our mentor was Monadroy Goswami. Over this week, we made a short 30-second video to capture our experience at Oak Ridge, and we hope you enjoy it. Science. <laughs> <laughs> what is polyscience, you might say? 
Polymer science is a subfield of material science concerned with polymers, primarily synthetic polymers such as plastics. Polymers are important because they are used to make many things such as airplanes, tires, and medicines. For example, scientists are now working on a polymer which will allow medicine to pass through the blood-brain barrier and deliver important dosage directly to the brain. How polymers work. The word polymer is derived from the Greek words poly and merge, meaning many parts. A polymer is a macromolecule made of a monomers, a molecule that can be bonded together with other monomers. A repeating strand of molecules that links polymers together is called a polymer chain. To better understand molecules, we use computer simulations. Computers help us to predict or design novel materials for future applications. As you can see at the bottom of the screen, there's a picture of a molecule we finished on the BMD program using the supercomputer. Using visual molecular dynamics, a polymer molecule simulator, we observed a polymer macromolecule in its natural state in the presence of surfactants. This gave us a better view of the molecule so that we could observe its visualization state at different charges. We used BMD for our entire project. We learned how to program and how to change the color of a molecule and how to add a box around it to define the space. There's an app for that. We use supercomputer type and molecular dynamic simulation technique to simulate the polymer and surfactant system. And you can see all the yellow that's right there, that is the surfactant tail. And you can't see it too good, but there's green around that, and that's the surfactant head. That is what makes up the molecule, and it gets bonded by that purple blob in the middle, which is the polymer chain. The purple means polymer neutral, and there's blue in there, that's the polymer charge. When the higher the charge, it takes the surfactant and it wraps it into a big cluster. Surfectant ions, oh my. <laughs> Over here is a model for surfectant. The yellow is represented as a surfectant tail, and the green is represented as a surfectant head. The yellow has, the surfectant tail has a neutral charge, and the head has a negative charge. The, and it's located in this area, as she said. The polymer chain here, the purple is neutral, and the blue is represented as the positive. And that Positive and negative will attract to each other and they will latch on. The polymer chain will combine the molecule surfactant. And we have a small visual here to represent how the polymer chain works. Can y'all hear me without the mic? Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> This is our molecule, and the yellow is the surfactant tail, and the green is the surfactant head. And we're going to show you how the polymer chain, which is this, latches onto the molecule. It leaps through, and the higher the charge, it forms it together to make sort of like a ball, but it's because this is the blue, which is the polymer charge, and this is the pink slash purple, which is the polymer neutral. When the higher the charge, the chain weaves its way through, sneaky little snake, and it goes all the way through and puts the molecule in place. And that is how it works. The other part of the molecule is the counter ions. Counter ions are ions that have a negative or positive charge and they just float freely around the entire molecule. They're used to keep the entire mo molecule balanced. <laughs> the chain uses electrostatic attraction to form around the molecule. Electrostatic attraction is the attraction of two atoms of opposite charges and holds every atom together. In polymers, the electrostatic attraction occurs when the surfactant head, a negative atom, bonds with the polymer charge, a positive atom. Here are the final results at different charge levels. 
based on the initial stage. At charge level 100, you can see the polymer chain and the surfactants are loosely bound. <laughs> anyway, they're loosely bound. But if you compare that to the 500 charge, you see all the surfactant and polymer chain in a ball up in the corner. And that is because as you increase the charge, the chain's charges increases and pulls all the molecules together. Here we have a short molecular time lapse that shows what happens to the molecule over time. We perform molecular dynamic simulation on polymer surfactant complexes. Increasing the number of charges on the polymer chain makes larger complexes. Electrostatic interactions are the most dominant interactions in any charge system. We would like to thank RAU and RNL and, and our mentors, Ramjo Goswami and Bobby Sankar. We have had such an amazing experience and hope that others will have the same opportunity to experience our beneficial research in a really good food. We would also like to thank ARC Director Jeff Schwartz and our ARC Project Director Jennifer Tyrell, who is the happiest and nicest person on the planet. <laughs> as well as the resident teachers, Pat Fitzpatrick, Mary Sue Kelly, Billy Lindell, and Colt Nanmore. These people have made our time here so much fun, they made us feel so welcome, and we are forever thankful for them. Thank, thank you. you. I didn't get nervous until I walked up. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Glad to have everyone here. Um, thanks for your support, sponsorship, and attention. The project that we'll be showing you today is called <laughs> Nanoparticle Self Assembly and Collective Behavior. I'm Cassie Holloba, I'm from Geneva, Pennsylvania, and I go to Youngsville High School. An interesting fact about me is I shoot trap, and my dad is my high school trap coach. And this is me. <laughs> um, I live in Tuskegee, Alabama, and I attend Brooklyn T. Washington High School, and the interesting fact about me is I play the guitar at 12 of Dolphins once. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'm Kevin Reynolds. I'm going to be a senior at Wilson High School, and I'm from North Wilsburg, North Carolina. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> and the interesting fact about myself is that I have fractured my eye socket. Oh Please my do not ask me how. <laughs> Bobby, congratulations. I'm from Cumberland, Maryland, and I go to Allegheny High School. And an interesting fact about me is that I once skydived off the Eiffel Tower while juggling. And the high speed chase after Osama bin Laden actually is really <laughs> I did not catch him, but I did plan to try. <laughs> that is a true story. <laughs> By now, you're probably wondering what a nanoparticle even is, and where he'll hear she tell you that a nanoparticle is a nanoscopic particle that is less than 100 nanometers. So basically, it's really small. <laughs> really is a nanometer. There are 10 atoms to make one nanometer, and if you take a piece of hair and you look at the width of it, there's 20,000 nanometers in that one little piece of hair. And there are 25,400,000 nanometers in an inch, and if you took a marble and pretended like it was a nanometer, the width of the entire Earth would be one meter. <coughs> Nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is the manipulation of matter on a molecular, atomic, and supermolecular scale. So the whole idea behind our project was that when you heat a group of nanoparticles with a laser, they actually kind of jump, and this jump changes their compositional structure, and depending on the initial shape of the nanoparticles, the resulting droplets jump at different speeds and move in different directions. So like, when they jump, they mimic uh, collective behavior, which you will learn about in a minute. But in the end, of, this makes the resulting material more complex. Now, 
we thought the jetpack was enough as far as complexity is concerned, but we were explained, and now I know a little bit about collective behavior of the nanoparticles. And collective behavior, well, I guess the way I'll explain it is starting on the individual basis. When you have one item it, or one planet or one bird, is the way that the planet is, it affects the other planets or particles around it while well, based on its gravity or so on and so forth. But when you get multiple planets, multiple birds together, they all affect each other in small ways that end up affecting each other in a very large way. So planets in a solar system, the gravity is just going to cause some rotation. But when you get a whole bunch of planets together, the collective behavior takes over and you get a spiral or a globular cluster. And the same concept applies to birds. When one bird moves in a certain direction, he can do whatever he wants. But when multiple birds get together, the collective behavior takes over and you get this flocking effect. And that also applies, we learned, to nanoparticles. <laughs> So what can nanotechnology and nanoparticles actually be used for? One example is automobiles. You can use them in different metals made of nanoparticles, and all the metals will be a lot lighter and cheaper. So the fuel for your vehicle, you won't need as much, and it will be a lot cheaper for you in the long run. And also, NASA is coming up with a space elevator in a few years, and the chain that the elevator is going to run on from Earth to space is going to be made of nanoparticles. There could also be scratch-resistant nanoparticle coating that could be put on everyday things like eyeglasses and cars. Using these nanoparticles could also make sunscreen thinner. The particles will make it harder for the UV rays to reach the skin. These coating increases the resistance to chipping and scratching. Scientists have come up with a synthetic bone and tissue that they can replace fractured bones, broken bones, and soft tissue injuries. Um, the damage done to healthy cells by chemotherapy can actually be reduced by instead using nanoparticles and putting the drugs into them and then sending them into the person's body so no healthy cells are damaged. And also, if you take silver nanoparticles and put them on bandages, then it will heal your cuts faster because the silver kills all the infected cells around the cut. <laughs> now we have a video uh, prepared to show you, and before we start the video, um, I'm going to explain the website we use to produce our simulation. We're actually simulating the movement of nanoparticles, and we use a simple programming website called Scratch. And in Scratch, there's these small things called sprites, and you can control where these sprites move, but since they can't actually interact, we can only mimic the collective behavior of nanoparticles. So, hand it over to together, 
you can make a recognizable shape or pattern, and here's the recognizable shape or pattern that we chose to make. <laughs> And it will be way too simple for theoretical physics because the collective kind of behavior takes over. Um, once you have all these particles moving up by themselves, or together, I should say, once they're all moving up together, they affect each other the same way that I explained earlier. And it could create a slightly different pattern. It might not create Mario, it might do something completely different. And here's us simulating that. It takes a few seconds to kick in. This is 
nitrogen across the three-eighth inch orifice. This is the models Q1 and Q2, which we use to compare to our data. The equations for Q1 and Q2 are right up here. Um, the graph is consistent across all data and we use area and pressure for our analysis. Q1 and Q2 fall short of the data. And that is because the high side pressure was not fixed with our data. These are oscillations measured by an oscilloscope with helium flowing across a one half inch orifice. We took the high side pressure in red and took the low side pressure in green and got our differential pressure. After we got our differential pressure, we had to get the width of the differential pressure. So we took our, the maximum of the wavelength and subtracted the minimum from it. This gave us a width and the graph changed throughout testing. This is nitrogen across the 3 8 inch orifice. It shows the dependence on gas and the linear dependence. The width of the oscillation mentioned in the previous slide multiplied by area and graphed against mass flow rate is what this is. As you can see, we had some problems with saturation, which is when the Scope, not scope. The sensor is undersized and it can't measure higher than that. So that's why we have this drop off right here. This graph shows nitrogen and helium dependence on orifice diameter. Helium has a dependency on the orifice diameter because it is a constant line. This also means it is linear. Nitrogen is not a constant line, which means it's not linear and other and there's no clear relationship with the graph. This means there is further testing to uh, require. So to sum up, the models for mass flow rate didn't match the data, but it did model the linearity of it. The saturation sometimes caused a problem, and it made our oscillations not as clear as they otherwise would be. Um, orifice size also affected saturation. For example, a higher pressure drop was a result of smaller orifice diameters, and saturation often coincided with higher mass flow rates. Pump performance is consistent with previous findings, leveling off at about 150 cubic meters per hour. And helium has a clear linear dependence on orifice size, whereas nitrogen does not, indicating a need for further study to confirm other factors. We would like to thank Jeff Schwartz, Robert Duckworth, Jennifer Tyrell, ARC, ORNL, and ORAU for our amazing two weeks we have had here. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We would like to thank you for being here this morning. First, my colleagues and I would like to introduce ourselves. I am Aaron Lancaster of Cumberland, Maryland, and I go to Allegheny High School. I'm Bethany Young, and I'm from Clay County, West Virginia, and I go to Clay County High School. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Riley Mosby from Oak Ridge High School, and I'm from here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Brianna Johnson from Wilkesboro, North Carolina, and I attend Wilkes Central High School. I'm Christina Collins from Monroe County High School, Monroe County, Kentucky. And today we are going to do a presentation on an investigation we did on calibrating optical diagnostics for use on the prototype material plasma exposure experiment, proto impacts. device used to study PMIs or plasma um, material interactions. 
And um, it's going to be used for future research um, on nuclear fusion devices like ITER. And um, ITER is the world's largest international um, collaboration for future energy resources. And it includes China, the European Union, India, Japan, South Korea, Russia, and the United States. And ITER um, was an acronym for International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactors. But it doesn't stand for that anymore. It just means the way in Latin. Okay. <laughs> and Tudor. Okay. JK, this is the building site for Tudor, where she and France. And um, <laughs> that little, like, part right there. Yeah. Right, yeah, right there. That's going to be where it will be. And the rest is surrounding buildings for Tudor. Plasma is the fourth state of matter. It's a collection of electrons and atomic nuclei that when it's heated, it um, forms plasma. Um, um, oh. Oh, okay. Uh, It's like ice, so when it gets heated, it goes to the water phase, and after the water phase, it gets heated again, and it goes to the gas phase. Then after the gas phase, it gets heated once again to the plasma phase, which is like fire, lightning, or the sun. is a nuclear process in which light nuclei um, fuses together. Um, the temperature at which fusion usually occurs is also the temperature at which plasma is usually at. So it's important because it's inexhaustible. It's better for the environment and it's also sa a lot safer than fission. As you can see in the diag can I in the diagram, um, you see the tritium and um, tr tritium, titanium and tritium, with each with the proton, and tritium with two protons. And when they combine together, they get you get helium. Um, so diagnostic systems. So through our project, we use fiber optics, which transfer light, couplers to connect our fibers, a spectrometer, which simply reads the spectrum, and a lab sphere, which is a proxy light for proto index. And then this lower picture is a, is a lab sphere. And then up there in the top picture is Aaron and I putting in data into Excel. And then over here is the spectrometer. Um, we also had to find the relative transmission, which is basically how well the fiber optic cable transfers light. And to calculate the relative transmission, you have to first measure fiducial, which is um, the starting light transmission without a cable, and then measure each individual cable. Then you divide the cable transmission by the fiducial, and then the quotient of your two is your relative transmission. So here you'll see some data and results from the experiments we conducted. Right here is a graph of fiber A underscore zero three. On the x-axis we have our wavelength of light going from ultraviolet through the visible spectrum to infrared. And on the y-axis we have our relative transmissions. As you can see by this graph, this is a fairly good fiber for transmitting light. The relative transmittance stays at about 85% all the way through. So it's not very good for specific wavelengths, but it's very good if you're studying the broad spectrum. In our next graph here, you'll see a graph of fiber B3 underscore zero two. And as you can see, there's some manufacturing areas in this fiber at about 800 nanometers and about 900. And 
if you look here, it's not very good fiber for transmitting a lot of wavelengths of light. But if you're wanting to look at just the spectrum between 500 and 650 nanometers, it's at about a relative transmittance of 95%. And in our next couple of slides, we're going to look at some wavelengths of 532 and 656. And here you'll see all 156 of the fibers we did spectroscopies on them labeled on the x-axis. On the y-axis, you'll see the relative transmissions of each one at wavelengths of 532 for the blue and 656 for the red. Some of our fibers were, had very high relative transmissions, while some of them towards the end were very poor, probably a lot of manufacturing areas could have been broken during shipping or a lot of other factors. And here you'll see our color transmission on the y-axis and the number of each fiber is on the x-axis. Now these are the transmissions of the couplers that are used to pair the fibers together on their way from the spectrometer to the lab sphere. And we got this by using an equation that divided the total transmittance of the paired fibers by the product of the relative transmissions of each individual fiber. And that gives us the transmission of the coupler. And you can see that it's very important to keep track of which couplers you're using because some of them have a very high relative transmittance while some of them only transmit about 60% of the light they travel to. Over the past two weeks, we've transmitted about 156 individual fibers, which is a lot, and they each have different characteristics of themselves. And we transmitted 60 coupled fibers and the transmission of the couplers were calculated. And you have to remember that when collecting data from proto pets, it's important to keep track of every special specific fiber and couplers because eventually, if you need one, like it was shown up above, if you need one in the range of 500 to 700, then one will be used. But if you needed a broad, spe broad spectrum fiber, then that would be a good one. It's important for us to do this because without calculation of each fiber, inaccurate measurements for light transmission could occur and the diagnostic system must be calibrated in order to meet experimental conditions. As a summary, a spectrometer is used to measure plasma emission that will be made on proto -MPEX. Data was transferred to the computer by connecting fiber optic cables to a lab sphere and the spectrometer. Excel was used to plot data and find the relative transmission between the fiducial and each cable. A cable was then connected using a coupler and the relative transmission was once again found and the mean value of each cable was found to compare all transmissions and wavelengths for the best cable. Okay, so we'd like to acknowledge a couple of people and give them a special big warm thanks. Um, Jeff Schwartz, Jennifer Tyrell, people at ORU, and um, our mentor, Ted, who's pretty great, and uh, his two interns, Gwen and Holly, and the people at RNL and the art program. Hello, my name is Walker McGrath, and our presentation will be about the robotic systems and engineering development. Basically, just a really fancy word for robots that move. Um, during our presentation, we're going to discuss the fundamentals of robotics, including computer programming, electrical wiring, and yeah, just the basics of robotic maneuvering. So, and we're also going to discuss what we did for our two-week program at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And this is a picture of the group members, and at this point, each group member is going to give a 20-second synopsis of their entire life. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hi. So, I'm Jane Bedham, and I'm from Bradford, Pennsylvania, and I go to Bradford Area High School. I'm going to be a rising senior. And I'm interested in studying abroad. I love traveling, so that fits. Um, since coming here, I now have an interest in engineering, whether it be mechanical or biomedical. I'm still deciding. And I have a big interest in medicine and language. So hi, I'm Hillary Jones. I live in Natural Bridge Station, Virginia, and I go to Rockridge County High School. I'm a rising senior. And I'm going to try to major in criminal justice and minor in forensic sciences. And that's my dog. 
Hi, I'm Danielle Kizzi, I'm from Boone, North Carolina. Um, I'm going to be a senior at Rivago High School, and I want to attend Duke University with a pre-med path, but I want to major in biology for science. Hi, I'm Mary Van Fair. I'm from Lehmansbury, Pennsylvania. I am a rising sophomore at East Strasburg North, and I would one day like to attend Penn State. Hello, as you already know, my name is Walker. I attend, Cumberland, I attend Allegheny High School in Cumberland, Maryland. I'm interested in studying at Johns Hopkins University for biomedical engineering, and I'm a rising senior at Philadelphia. Hello, my name is Lucas Warren. I attend Clay County High School in Clay County, West Virginia. I'm a rising senior. I plan on attending West Virginia University in the study of mechanical engineering and minoring in aerospace engineering. I'm, I'm Kylie O'Haver. I'm from Cumberland, Maryland, and I'll be a senior at Fort Hill High School. I plan on majoring in history and psychology at Brenna and Kentucky, and minoring in biology and English. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Greg Peterson. I'm from Gaffney, South Carolina. I'll be a senior at Gaffney High School this year, and I'm from attending Clemson University. Hello, I'm Michael Byers. I'm from Hazard, Kentucky. I attend Hazard High School where I'll be a, se a senior. I plan on attending New York University CERN School of Business and majoring in global business or finance. So throughout this entire course, basically we worked up to it one goal. And that goal was to program a robot and wire it so that it could complete a fairly complex course in the shortest amount of time possible. So from the very beginning, we divided up into five separate groups, and each of us programmed our own separate robot. And we kind of made it like a competition for an incentive, and you'll see later a demonstration of a robot completed in the track. We, one of the things that we did was we went to Pellissippi Community College because our facilitators are professors of the robotics program there. We worked on the robotic arm that they have and wired the, well, programmed one of their machines to flash a light. Okay, so on Wednesday we went to Remote Tech. And what we did is Remote Tech is actually a company that works with the military, law enforcement, and first responders. And we actually got a chance to operate and control some of the robots that they did. And we also got to shoot a water cannon at this box. And so this is the entrance point of the water cannon. You turn around, that's the exit point. And so that was on the robots, now it's really awesome. It was really loud, and I can scream. <laughs> I was looking at birds and got distracted. And there's supposed to be a video, but it's not working, yeah, so. Greg? Oh, okay. Command that tells you what is wrong with the 
with the program, and it's, it's a troubleshooting program. The, uh, the pause pauses the program. The do loop repeats the program continuously. The if then statement. If two scenarios occur, then the program will pick the desired of the two. The pulse out command is a command that sends an electrical pulse to the uh, to a selected motor. <coughs> this motor then moves in a selected direction and at a selected speed. Okay, so the first type of um, sensor that we use is sonar, also called the ping sensor. The ping sensor sends out sound waves and uh, receives the ones that bounce back, like in a very short amount of time, milliseconds. And um, using the ones that bounce back, it can tell not only where an object is, but the distance it is from an object. And then you can program it to do whatever you want when it comes to the And then um, our infrared line followers, um, they can uh, just they can see the difference between light and dark areas according to the amount of light reflected. And we used three different types. The first type was pretty general on what it saw, and it couldn't like define a line or anything. The second type had different eight different light emitters, and it could follow a line, but the third type was the fastest, had the fastest reaction time according to that, and it had three different light sensors. The next robot we used was the Lynx Motion Track robot. It is a bigger robot, it runs on tracks similar to a tank, it is quicker and more efficient, and has slightly different programming. Okay, so this is going to be our demonstration, and the lighting is different here than when we had originally programmed the robot. So it may or may not work, but I'm hoping for the entertainment of all of us that it works. <laughs> that one. It's me and Walker's robot and it's awesome. And this is me and Walker's portion of the four piece track. It was like a boss. Eat everyone up. <laughs> okay. So when programming the robot it took a lot of trial and error and tweaking to make sure like it had the right programming so it could go the right speed and it wouldn't oscillate too much and it would have like nice turns. So this is just our results uh, with our pulse out rates and our time to complete the course, like how long it took us with the different pulse out rates for each wheel. So. Uh, right here is a chart of all the final results. Uh, each of us performed three trials with all of our robots, and these are the groups. It pretty much speaks for itself. <laughs> That's our <obvious> time. <laughs> it's your <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, in conclusion, we'd like to thank the Appalachian Regional Commission for allowing us to to come to this amazing program. I personally learned a ton. I learned I knew nothing about robotics coming into this. And now, I know everything there is to know about robotics. <laughs> <laughs> also, thanks to Mr. Jeff Schwartz. Much thanks to OrAU's Jennifer Tyrell. She was absolutely phenomenal. Go people! <laughs> I'd like to give a thanks to our mentors, Adam Carroll and Adam Aaron, and they're super awesome assistants, you know, got Sunny and Paul and Elliot and Gloria. They were pretty nice and they were awesome and they taught me a lot about college and engineering that I didn't know before. Thank you to our facilitator, Carl Millett. And Ken Swain. I want to also give thank yous to the new Yeah, he was also one of our mentors. Thank you, everyone. All right, well, something has happened. Um, we did do nuclear physics, just wasn't that as in shy as the SNS, which is a spallation new, uh, neutron source. I'm not sure where that age and a couple wise came from. Um, <laughs> whatever now. I'm Jonathan Beeman. I teach in Winder, Georgia at Appalachian High School. This is uh, Mark Falling. Failing? Man, 
except for today, and I'm still here. Um, he's from Gaffney, South Carolina. And got oh wait, where's my face? Oh, he got it. Oh, no, I was going to point at you guys. And uh, this is Michael uh, Pakanowski from Tobihana, Pennsylvania. Um, so our research, well, the research they're doing is at least in our our sections. Focus, oh, let me get this guy. Focuses on really everything in here. Um, starting mostly at the beginning here in the Big Bang, uh, and especially this first 10 to the negative 30 second, sec second portion we call inflation, where all the energy starts to coalesce into material. Um, there are a lot of assumptions of what should be going on there, and basically they're trying to prove that it's all true. So, um, let me see. I'm going to do the fundamental science behind all of this, starting with the idea of symmetry. Now, symmetry, we've talked about there are three essential symmetries, and actually the, what we find out is that they just, neither of them actually apply completely. It's charge conjugation, which says that basically there should be as much matter as antimatter in the universe, and basically since we aren't all constantly canceling out with our antimatter other, that just doesn't happen. That's the first symmetry that really we've seen doesn't hold and work. The second is parity, which says that all physical systems should work the same, basically in the positive direction as the negative in space. That also has been proven not to be quite true. Um, the third is time reversal symmetry, which says everything should work forward just as well as backward. Um, that one actually hasn't been proven to be completely uh, incorrect yet, but we're trying. Um, all right. Last thing I've got, I believe, well, is about the neutron, which obviously is the neutron source, so we've got to get into what that is. Um, they're most of the time found in the atomic nucleus, the nucle the nucleus. They have a charge of zero. Um, that allows them to be really useful in certain nuclear experiments. And uh, just this will come up a little later, they've got a spin of one half that can be either be up or down, and that gets used a lot. Um, man, we just take the neut neutron apart. We're going to take the neutron, and actually it's made up of one up quark and two down quarks. Now the up quark has a charge of positive two thirds the um, electron charge, and the down quark has a charge of negative one third. You add all that up, you have two positive two thirds, two negative thirds, and you end up with a total charge of zero. I need, I need everything. Okay, so where do we get the neutrons from? We start with a uh, negative hydrogen ion, which is just a proton and two electrons orbiting around it. And then we take those ions and put them into an accelerator, which is about 1,000 feet long, and those things go at about 90% the speed of light. And so they're going really fast, and then towards the end, they go through a foil, which actually strips the ions of the electrons. So you just have protons left. And proton accumulator ring, right? they go into there, which is kind of this uh, square type thing with the, the corners kind of rounded off. And the protons go around it really, really fast and they bunch up, they accumulate. Uh, and after they bunch up, when they get to the, uh, the right amount of force, they're projected into the target, which is that up there. And it's the cylindrical rectangular thing yeah, right there. Uh, and that's full of liquid mercury. It's a heavy metal. And so you have these protons going really fast. They're, they're beamed out about, I think, roughly, what was it, 60 times per second. Um, and they hit the nucleus, some of them hit the, hit the nucleus of the liquid mercury. And the neutrons are spalled out. So they're just kind of projected outwards. Uh, and then these things are going way too fast. So we have to slow them down and we then project them into water, and then project them into liquid hydrogen. Uh, and this is just the basic layout. That big, long section up top is the accelerator, and then you can see um, it goes into the ring, and then eventually the target, and then these things are then beamed out for use of uh, various experiments. Uh, one of those uh, beams is used for nuclear physics research. And currently there are four experiments going on. Uh, they're all in various stages. 
Uh, has NPD gamma, which is, is done taking data just in the um, stages of analyzing data. Uh, and there's the N3 helium, uh, which they're currently getting ready and to put into the beam. And then there's two upcoming <coughs> ones, uh, NAB and NEPM. So I'll be discussing each of those. Uh, the first one, the NPD gamma, uh, is looking at uh, the asymmetry violation and trying to find one of the coefficients uh, called F pi and that asymmetry. Uh, the basic uh, reaction that's going on is a neutron is coming in with a certain spin. Uh, it's colliding with a proton from liquid hydrogen, it's a liquid hydrogen nucleus. And when their collision occurs, you might expect that uh, the, the, the gamma rate that's given off might go off in any direction, but we're looking for if there's an uneven dis distribution, like you can see here, we're lined closer together. Uh, greater, uh, this investigation will also give a greater understanding to uh, the weak interaction, which has been studied for years, but it's very difficult to understand because it's overshadowed by the strong interaction. The basic design of this experiment, uh, the neutrons are coming in here. The first thing that they hit, uh, first major component, is the polarizer. And that's what puts all the neutron spins going in one direction. Uh, we then have a spin flipper, which allows researchers to flip that spin either up or down and a li liquid uh, hydrogen <coughs> target, which contains a proton. Once the uh, collision occurs, uh, the neutron and uh, proton collide, uh, combine form a deuteron, the gamma is given off, and the gamma direct detectors that actually make a cylinder around uh, the target to see what direction those uh, gamma rays come off. Uh, this is a, a model of the actual uh, full-scale full detector and the neutrons are coming in from this corner down here in the bottom left. Uh, these are some actual pictures of the device. This is before it was disassembled. Uh, you can see about what the scale of the uh, pieces are. Uh, this is us actually working, uh, myself and Jonathan, we're disassembling part of the structures that were in there. And you can see some of the other components. Uh, like I said, that one was finished taking data. They're now working on a second experiment to put into the beam, and that's the N3 helium, and this is a works in works with the first experiment that NPD gamma to give a more a better understanding of uh, the asymmetry. Uh, in this reaction, we have a again a neutron coming in from the beam. Uh, it collides with a helium three nucleus, which has uh, two protons and one neutron. Uh, what comes out is a hydrogen three nu nucleus, which has one pro uh, one proton, two neutrons, and then a proton goes the other direction. So. Uh, the design of this detector, again, we have the beam coming in, we have a, a polarizer, and then a little different type of spin flipper, which I'll show you a picture of in just a second. It's called an RF, a radio frequency spin rotator. Uh, and that allows them to turn the uh, spin of the neutrons either parallel to the direction of travel or anti-parallel. And then uh, the target this time has the yes, helium-3, as mentioned earlier. Uh, this, this particular device right here is the spin flipper. Uh, it, the RF spin flipper is a, a, a new design. It's a rather ingenious in being able to cause it to flip. Uh, this is the chamber which will contain that helium-3. It's a, an ion chamber. And we actually did some testing on that. Uh, you can see Jonathan and Michael there working with a vacuum tube, connecting a small piece right there, which was a connector that was sparking originally. And we had to test that the new uh, replacement one wouldn't spark. Uh, the next one that, that will be coming up uh, a couple of years from now is the NAD uh, experiment, which is looking at neutron decay. What happens to neutron decay, as John, uh, Justin mentioned, is the neutrons are made up of two down quarks and an up quark. Uh, one of those down quarks will decay into an up quark and give off what's called a W boson. Uh, that W boson does not live very long. It decays into an electron and an electron antineutrino. And that's the reaction that uh, we study. The goal of this is to give a better understanding of the new, uh, decay of the neutron, why it happens, or when it happens, the different factors that go into it. So again, some different different top items that are being measured. Uh, and trying to learn the physics beyond the standard model, which is kind of the state of understanding nuclear physics. The basic design of this, uh, we have a, again, a, the neutron beam coming in, we have a, a small area here where the uh, neutrons decay. Uh, the, the proton will be pulled up by an electric field, a <coughs> high voltage source, and the electrons are pulled down. There's also a magnetic field which causes the charged particles to rotate. Uh, 
and then silicon detector both at the top and the bottom. Uh, this, this detector can be very large, it can be a challenge to put into the beam, it gives you a kind of idea, an idea of how large this is. Uh, there's a, an overhead crane here which uh, they had designed a structure that would just stay under that beam, that crane. Uh, they also had designed a new way of getting this detector into the beam, so they designed this large structure and you can see how large it is compared to the person standing there. Uh, they're going to pull it in and rotate it into place. Uh, the last of the experiments is called the NEM. Uh, experiments at the neutron electric dipole moment. Uh, and they're going to use uh, the neutrons with their uh, electric dipole, which comes from them spinning. And as John mentioned, the neutron is neutral, but it does have charges. Anytime you rotate something that's char has charges in it, it will basically become a small magnet, a dipole. Um, we're looking at that time invariance. Remember, John said that that's one that hasn't been uh, shown yet. Uh, here's the reaction. Again, the neutrons coming in, helium three, and then there's what's given up. Uh, this is going to be a very large detector. Uh, and that, again, doesn't, isn't supposed to come online until 2019. All right, so <clears throat> we have, as every other group, a lot of people to thank. I want to especially thank um, Sapo Pantilla, who uh, was our mentor and let us work with very expensive, delicate, unique devices for a couple weeks and uh, taught us a ridiculous amount of stuff about very complicated physics. Um, also, I'd like to thank a couple of speakers, or people who are working with them, Chad Gillis, Chris Hayes, and Pat Mueller who all came and explained their parts of the experiment. In addition to Jeff Schwartz, Jennifer Tyrell, everyone at ARC, ORNL, ORU, and um, anybody who helped organize this program. And we just had a really good time with all the students and teachers and everybody else in there. Glad so I got to be here. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Our project was on understanding energy efficiency in buildings using computer simulations. Our mentor was Vinny Marcaltra at ORNL, and I'm Mackenzie Langman from Clay, West Virginia. I am Maggie New, and I am from Ithaca, New York. So the mission of our project was that we were going to um, participate and design a building that we were going to test with two computer simulation programs. We were going to put them in different locations to see how the results and data came out. Our task was that we were going to use NEAT and MULTI softwares that were developed at Olara NL and that we were going to use the results, the data, and evaluate to see the uh, benefits and limitations of each program. So the two programs that we use, the first one we use is NEAT. So it's National Energy Audit. It's a um, single family house, so it means that it's just for one family. And it's not, it's typically can be multi-level um, square foot can change. It's computer based, so it means that it lives on my computer or it lives on Mackenzie's computer, but it doesn't live between us. The other program we use was Multi. Oh, oh got clicker out of here. <laughs> Multi is a multi-family, so it can be um, apartment complex, it can be one level or multiple level levels. It was also de uh, designed and developed at ORNL and it's web-based. So I can work on it, Mackenzie can work on it. <coughs> so the dwelling. The first thing we had to do was we had to design our house. We had to figure out what we wanted in it. So this is our house, we stuck small, um, it's 1,200 square feet, there was two bedrooms, there's two baths, there's a door with no glass, six windows um, that were relatively small placed throughout the house, and two windows that were larger that were in the living room um, to give more solar energy, solar efficiency. It was important when we designed the house as we developed um, to figure out where uh, the direction was for more sunlight. We also had a four foot attic, which is important because we find out what their results and if the eight foot attic has some issues. <coughs> Our pit, so the next thing we had to do was we looked at the map of the United States and figured out climate wise where we wanted our locations. So we picked six of them. So our first one is there are seven zones, and we only picked six. The reason why is because zone one is in the southernmost tip of Florida and in Hawaii, and we all like to live there. However, it's not really a realistic for the majority of people. <laughs> so our first pick was West Palm Beach, where I like to vacation. Our second one is Los Angeles, California. Third is Knoxville, Tennessee. Fifth is 
Chicago, Illinois. And we argued over the name. I said Helena. It's Helena Montana. And the last one, which I'd never heard of until El Roker brought it up the other day, is Caribou Maine. So what happens next? So we picked our, we created our dwelling, we picked the places we we're going to put it, and then we put it into the computer. <coughs> so we did the analysis, we ran the results, we got them, and you look at the charts, you're like, something went wrong. So we went back through, we did the corrections, and we did more analysis to check the reports. This is where our mentor came in, and she looked at the results and said, here are some variables you want to check out, go back through. Went through the reports, and then we made sense of it all. Okay, so we only are showing you the cooling use because after we went back and fixed the difference between an eight foot attic and a four foot attic between the two programs, our heating uses actually came out similar, which was what we were looking for, so we didn't have to go back and change them. However, the cooling results are not close. This is where what the, our facilitators were kind of looking for because they want to know if the two programs are similar in everything, and we found issues. So our graph is spread apart and complications between the two programs. So there's a thermostat. Each program has a different assumption for the daily use of two families. In multi, you can describe how much lighting and how much appliances you use every day, which are heating. And then at the end of the day, those turn out to be cooling loads. In neat, you can put input how many people are home during the day and home at night which is in multi, you can't, so these are going to be different schedules. And the internal shading. In one program, in NEAT, you just have one factor. They assume you keep your shades open all year long. In multi, they have two factors. Summer, you usually keep your shades open, or closed. Winter, you keep them open. And then the heat transfer. In in NEAT, the way the heat transfer is calculated is instantaneous. In multi, it assumes for the mass of the building, whereas the walls take in the heat and then they release them later. So that describes our differences between the two graphs. And now our facilitators are going to take what we found and go back and try to fix them so the two programs are more similar. <coughs> and our energy use versus degree days. This actually came out really similar between the two programs, which is what we were looking for. But however, we found that in the colder climates, the energy use increased. So it means that this house wasn't really efficient in cold climate weather. So this is where retrofits could come in. Our facilitators can go back in our program and put double pane glass windows where we only have single pane glass. They can use thicker insulation. And they can put a more efficient heating system whereas we only put the base in. And where our grass spikes at the end, it will actually go down and make the house more efficient and cost. So, um, impacts after the day. So what the understanding of is that we know what meat and multi are, and given that I, we own a duplex and we're buying it on our house, this is a program that I can go in and use. Um, the other part is application of energy saving measures. So we can go back, especially nowadays, people are looking to save money. Um, we actually got into some really great discussions with our facilitators and our mentor about schools, because given that schools are about 100 years old now, whether uh, the school districts are going to want to upgrade, retrofit them, do measures like this, or whether they're going to want to build brand new ones um, that are already equipped with this. Um, the other part is for us, uh, as teachers, we're normally always in the classroom and we're always doing the hustle and bustle. And for us, this really opened up our eyes. Being When we walked in, we had a cubicle, we had labs, and we're like, well, we're not really sure what to do here. And it just was really different to kind of step outside and basically see what our students go through. Um, at one point, we walked in and our mentor was like, well, I think I want you to do this instead. And it's almost like when you see your students and they're like, oh, my Lord, what has she just done to us? And, you know, it's that self-reflection. We're like, okay, what do we got to do? How are we going to do it? And basically self-teaching yourself that we can get through it. Um, for us, our students too, we, you know, we grew up and wanted to be teachers, that's what we wanted to do. Coming here, we realized that there are so many more opportunities and options for kids that I'm not sure I ever knew about. I knew I wanted to be a teacher, I knew I liked kids, where I feel like, hey, you like math, science, or technology. We were just exposed to a huge facility with
with opportunities and internships that we can say, hey, not only to our colleagues, but to our students, our own kids, check this out. Appreciation. When you are a teacher and you're, you know, have kids and you say, this, you know, make plans, make goals, do something with it. This was actually the hands-on approach that I think for us was really important and kind of made us feel like when Mark came in on Thursday and said, you're going to do a presentation for us, and we didn't really know what to expect, and we were kind of like, what do you mean? We're, we're not ready. Our presentation's on Friday. And he sat down with us, and then he said, so next year we could have someone come in, we could have an intern come in and do this and follow up, and I'm like, oh, you're really going to use what we just did. It was like, wow, this isn't just kind of like an experiment. This is going the next step. So I think for us it came full circle, like as a teacher, as a student, and now going back to kind of facilitate this in our districts and with our kids. Acknowledgement. So, who, that is not my kid, we're not sure whose it is. <laughs> Thanks, clip art. So, we just want to say thank you to Jeff Schwartz and the program, ORC, um, O-R-N-L, O-R-A-U. Phenomenal, and it's kind of like Disney World. You go and it's really great when you're there and you're kind of on overload, and then you leave and you reflect back and you're like, I got to do this, I got to see this, this was awesome, the people I met. And it's kind of a surreal thing. Jennifer Terrell, she, you can't even imagine the chaos that goes on to this and the structures she has put in place for this program. Judy Dodd, um, she's our caterer, you'll have our lunch later, phenomenal. Pat, Billy, Mary, Sue, I, we're in awe of teachers. The, the way they run this program with these kids, get them on buses, get them places, um, just the safety in it all, the structure. Cole, our driver, got us there every day, never had to turn around to get an ID badge. Um, and it's things like that that you don't really realize when you see a program like this, that how much planning and organization and structure goes on. And I guess for us, the last part is, as a teacher, you're always a professional, it feels like. You're always in that suit to wear. And for us, I think, the 13 of the teachers that are here, we've really had a good time getting back to why we joined education, to be with our colleagues. So on that note, we're hoping it works. Do you need to click it. No. Click on the machine. It didn't work. No. So we had some slogans that came up along the way here. And we have a song that's not going to play. So we'll just go through the slogans. Yeah, the volume's up. <laughs> <laughs> we realize we're getting old. earlier, and I appreciate that, Elizabeth. Um, how many people have ever used or have a cell phone? Okay. How many people uh, use or have a laptop? Okay. Uh, camera? Okay. Um, electric vehicle? Oh, not as many. Lithium-ion batteries are involved more than likely with all of those. Now, I won't have you raise your hand on this part, but those of you born after 1985 have always had lithium ion batteries. Those of us a little more seasoned have not, okay, because they were produced commercially by Sony in 1985. So, why lithium ion batteries? Why are they so helpful? Why are they so um, important? They have high energy density, low maintenance, low self-discharge, which means that they're not in use 
They don't lose their, their, their charge. Quick charging, small and light. Longevity, you can uh, recharge them over and over and over again, and you'll see that about that's important later. And they are pollution free. The purpose of our uh, research project was to determine if a lithium carbonate that was uh, retrieved from a geothermal, a geothermal source was an appropriate alternative for a lithium carbonate that is mined traditionally. That was the focus of our uh, project. So, real quick, while you're sitting there, I need you to use your imagination real quick. Take your left hand, make a cup. <coughs> Take your right hand, make a fist. Put your fist in your cup and do this. I'll tell you when to stop. <laughs> okay, so as we're moving to electric cars, we're always thinking about the environment. You know, basically during my lifetime, we finally realized you can't just keep burning things up, leaving a mess all over the place. So, OR, r &L, especially CMI um, people, work at extracting lithium from the brine that comes off the geothermal plants, which are also producing clean energy. They were able to extract that, and therefore the brine has come back into the ground, goes below the water table, there's no waste, there's no negative impact on the environment. Also economics, right? We're always trying to build a better economy. Lithium is online to be the biggest solar battery in the world. If you look at the consumption, especially in batteries, and it could be for cars or phones and everything else. We, right now, import over 80% of the lithium that we use. Also, most of that lithium is mine, negative impact on the environment. So, we already have a geothermal plant, this company Symbol, who has asked CMI to look at their extracted lithium, is already set online to tap into a brine plant, and they're going to be able to extract lithium salts that would make us completely independent. They can extract that one plant, all the lithium we imported last year. All right, and so, <coughs> lost my drink out there. So if we do that, what we're, our project was, we're supposed to compare commercially mined lithium salts to these symbol salts. And that was our purpose. So we're hoping that we can become energy independent and create a new export, because if you export instead of importing, we're making money. You can stop now. Yeah. <laughs> so in our actual experiment, what we did is we actually took the symbol sample and we took the commercial sample. And when we mix them together, our goal is to make an anode. And when we mix these together, it involves a process that involves a lot of grinding. It's a solid state chemistry reaction. We can't mix these things with water, it just doesn't work, it doesn't react the same way. And you really need to be able to combine and make a solid product with lithium that's mixed throughout the entire anode. <laughs> so our project involved a lot of grinding, and that is going to be unique. So what we had to do is while we grind, we had to then put it into a heating container, allow some of the carbon dioxide to come out, we had to remix it again for extended periods of time, Heat it again, and then add some binding solution to finally make a slurry, which would eventually be put into a place to make an anode. Uh, altogether, it took about three hours of grinding. It's insane. <laughs> um, at the end, we take the powders and we actually look at them under a scanning electron microscope. Here's our symbol sample and our commercial sample. If you can take a look at them quickly, I'll tell you them side by side, but they can almost match up perfectly. They are about the exact same size and shape and everything. Then we take an x-ray diffraction, we're trying to look at what the composition of the materials are. In our commercial sample, we're seeing that we have this peak pattern that shows the compounds that are in it. Our symbol sample, we have these patterns of chemicals that are in it. And when we put them on top of one another, the goal is them to be exactly the same. And that's exactly what this we got. This is a beautiful thing. This is exactly what we wanted to see. This means that the symbol sample is just as good as any commercial sample which can mean a great big deal for American products. Eventually down the line, we would be able to make all the batteries and test them for life and capacity. And here's just some extra cool scanning electron microscope images that we got to see.
So Dan told you a little bit about the benefits of lithium ion batteries. Uh, they're really cool for what we do right now. But what's in the future? What are we looking for? Well, everything we know right now, within the next five years, will change. Everybody across the world, universities, research labs, ONR, ORNL, everybody is tackling this problem. They're using different uh, chemicals, they're using different compounds, different ways to lay them down on the anodes and cathodes, different uh, electrolytes to make them faster. Sometimes they, well, they're hoping to be able to charge within three minutes and last for days. They're hoping to make Tesla some new batteries so that they can go 400 miles between charges. Right now you've got 30 miles. Okay? So that's the types of things that we're looking for in the future. Hopefully they'll be smaller, lighter. They're using graphite compounds, which are very graphite foam. We all got to see before. Very wide, very durable. Um, and if the great thing is we are possibly going to be the importer. We're going to send exporter, I'm sorry, to send it to everybody else. We don't need to do that a lot. We buy everything from everybody else. Let's sell some if you want. Thank you. How, how are we going to use this information or these skills in our classroom? If you noticed in the video, we did a lot of journaling or keeping track in a notebook of what we did exactly. Guess what my kids are going to do this school year? They're going to be writing a lot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go with what Nate said. Uh, when I grew up, the jobs I thought about looking at were people that I knew already doing those jobs. So coming here and seeing such a wide variety of job opportunities, internship opportunities, that I'll be able to introduce my students to get them excited about it. You know, science isn't scary, it's fun. And you know, just hope, it's just tremendous. Uh, really guys, sorry. <laughs> coming back for the second time, it reminds me why I studied chemistry. The lovely excitement of creating something new and finding new ways to do it. Uh, I'm just happy that I got to be able to see some solid state chemistry. I've never actually done it. I've just heard about it, and I'm actually hoping to find a way that I can actually. I really hope that I can actually use this chemistry in my class. Have the kids actually find new, um, some compounds to see. It, it's not something you can get done in a matter of 10 minutes. Chemistry and science is something that takes time. You got a lot happening. You got to really wait to see what the results are, and it's exciting. It's the anticipation of what you're about to uh, actually find out. Um, should do the thank yous at the end. Have to, yeah. Should do the thank yous now. Let's do now. Let's just go back to the video. Just a quick note. Our, yeah, the labs did have a lab coat large enough to fit me. <laughs> <laughs> this is not it. So I just want to know that. Uh, thank you to uh, ARC, ORAU, and OR. And Al, it was a great experience. And really thank appreciate you to it. Jeff Schwartz and Jennifer Terrell and Pat, Mary, uh, Billy, and Cole. Jim Davis. Thank you, Jim Davis, our facilitator. Franz, thank you so much. And we really had to point out, Franz is very established. Master. Now we have, and we did not do this in the lab, just to let you know, <laughs> because we did follow all the safety procedures. A uh, little song and dance for you. So. Summarize our experience. Yeah. Yeah. All right, follow along when the chorus comes. Yeah, yes. when you're yes. you yeah. want to, yeah. Oh. Just 
Well, the advent of computer programming has made a huge, dramatic impact on the way DNA is modeled. For example, previously we had to use these ball and stick models or these space filling models that were built by hand. Very long time to make these. Now you can go to the World Wide Web and find the nucleic acid data bank, which actually has over 7,000 images. Now you might think, why do I need to see DNA 7,000 times? It's a double helix, right? But there are things that interact with DNA, and sometimes the way they interact with DNA is very telling. For example, this is the drug bleomycin. It's an anti-cancer drug. And you can see that it is kind of interpolated or placed in between the DNA strands. It actually has caused one of the strands to break. So what happens if a tumor cannot reproduce its DNA, replicate its DNA, then it can't grow. So if bleomycin is used, it might be able to stop a cancerous tumor from growing. Thank you, Peter. Carries oxygens to your cells. 
very important function. The second protein is the protein that is made by people cell, people cells that have sickle cell anemia. <coughs> what causes this big, huge change? One base pair. In DNA, one base pair was mutated and replaced with a different base. That resulted in a different amino acid being put in the protein, and because of that, the protein folds differently and causes the medical conditions that are associated with sickle cell anemia. So, the protein data bank, it provides this online with just the click of a button. We have really come a long way, and you can even use these in your classroom. Thank you, Peter. You're welcome. Thank you, Cheryl. category classy and sassy and we are up uh, not the last category the second last category no, I forgot random acts of science with no, Carmelita it's to infinity can be oh, all my mistake you have to talk about the future Peter that's correct because one day you guys will be able to go to the doctor and give him a little blood and he put it in his computer and in a, just a few hours you can have personal treatment based on your gene sequencing so it makes a whole bit of difference when you go to the doctor. And so that there's less chance for mistakes, I would think. A little bit. Isn't that exciting? It is. Thank yeah. you. So now we get to do the classroom classroom category. So for myself, back in the classroom in Horses, New York, I hope to teach my, well, I will be teaching my science students about some microorganisms that due to special DNA that they have or unique DNA that they have, some of them are actually able to eat certain types of pollution, like PCBs and oil during oil spills. So that is something that we'll definitely be working on this year. I'm excited to take back to Geneva, Ohio, all of the fun techniques that we learned how to teach um, DNA and protein. And I'm also looking forward to taking back all of the technology that we've learned. We learned a whole lot about advances in medicine and fuels and technologies and stuff like that. And I'm hoping to bring back to my classroom lessons that will bring real-world implications to these advances. I personally can't wait to use the protein data bank in my classrooms because when you see the pictures, all of a sudden you understand why things happen the way they do. So we had many different uses of not only the work that we did, but of the wonderful guest speakers that our uh, facilitator brought in. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thanks again. All right, so we are thanking everybody for tonight. So thank you for the show. Thank you for coming. the base sequence on the DNA. Now the DNA unfortunately can't come into the auditorium, not allowed. So it has to send a messenger. 
it sends an RNA molecule that carries the messenger, the message from the gene into the auditorium, to the rest of the cell. And that messenger RNA, we're pretending is hovering, don't you see it, <laughs> up here above the stage. Now we have all of our students bringing a transfer RNA that holds a specific amino acid to make the protein that needs to be made at this point in time. However, this time the amino acids are going to fit together much like words fit together to make a sentence. Show us your protein. Get it, guys. They have made this week phenomenal. We could always go to them if we needed anything, and if we had decided we wanted to give them a hard time that day, they took it like champions. Thank you so much. <laughs> 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 